Father Leopold was dismayed about his son's choice of Constanza. However, the young married couple apparently seemed to have a carefree future ahead of them in Vienna. Artistic business was going well. The Mozarts lived in very good residential areas. And in the meantime, Mozart enjoyed good food and he loved to drink champagne. Sauerkraut and liver dumplings were a thing of the past. It seemed as if Mozart was predestined to make a triumphant rise to fame. During this period in Vienna, Mozart earned a huge amount of money. Mozart earned money with his piano concertos. They were absolute hits. He earned about three times what the director of a hospital would earn. And also, you have to bear in mind that Mozart had a racehorse, a billiards table. He used to go and play billiards. That was all very expensive. If we examine this amount of income, we discover that in his first years in Vienna, Mozart must have earned at least 1,500 florins a year. Some biographers even mention incredible sums, such as several thousand florins. Based on present-day exchange rates, Mozart would have been very rich indeed during some of the years he spent in Vienna, and Mozart adored luxury. Of course, Mozart saw the magnificent clothes people wore at all the European courts. There is a famous letter to Baroness Wallstetten. This frock, she writes, this outfit tickles my nose. And he wanted to have a dress coat at all costs because it had such beautiful buttons. He wrote, I want to have everything that is good and beautiful. <laughs> The vanity of an artist. Mozart created a wonderfully ironic monument not only to himself, but his opera, De Schauspiel Director. Vanity and the permanent rivalry between all artists, singers, and composers are the subject of this work, which incidentally lost in direct competition with an opera by Salieri. Mozart was in any case constantly exposed to rivalry, particularly when he tried to acquire a prestigious appointment, such as that of court composer at the imperial court. Nevertheless, the decisive reason why Mozart was not appointed was probably his character. The position of court composer was in principle only for famous personalities who were also very good at administration. Salieri, Bono, his predecessor. They were excellent administrators. Mozart was certainly not a specialist in administration. He could not even manage his own money, let alone anything else. In other words, Joseph II and his successor were right in not giving him this top position. On the other hand, for reasons of prestige, Mozart was keen to be in the running for such a top position. Well-heeled, and as far as we know from Mozart's letters, frequently very attractive pupils formed an additional source of income for Mozart. This also opened the floodgates of speculation on this subject in his biography. Mozart the seducer, Mozart the womanizer, versus Mozart with a large nose and Mozart of slight stature. What is a genius allowed to be, hero or freak? As a freelance artist, Mozart had absolutely no other choice but to sell himself as well as possible. Undoubtedly, he often managed to do this in an excellent manner. But what would be the best way of promoting a Mozart superstar nowadays? In the case of Mozart, you would use a lot of the modern techniques for publicity that we are all familiar with. For example, he would be a great person to have on a chat show because of his music, because of his personal lifestyle. So, and then you would orchestrate to get him onto the chat shows appealing to the young. You would use the medium of radio, which is now so powerful that that would reintroduce him or introduce him and his museums. His personality is interesting. And so that would be how you do it. And the music is good enough, but it would not be a hard job. Mozart Magnus Corpore Pavos. Mozart is great, his body small, was how Mozart described himself. In 1786, he created one of the most successful operas of all time. Le Nozze di Figaro is nowadays one of the most frequently performed operas, but at that time, this miracle of a work received a mixed response from the mainly aristocratic audience. The Sac Madame. 
It is said that Mozart upset the Viennese aristocracy with his Figaro, but in Figaro there is absolutely nothing said against the aristocracy that had not already been said before. Basically, it is all a lot of nonsense, a decline in Mozart's quality or in his compositional powers or his expression simply cannot be recognized. These are the greatest masterpieces that he wrote at that time. I do not think that any kind of decline in the music can be recognized. For me, Mozart is incredibly exciting and challenging because the relationship between intention, psychology, portrayal, the words, the ideas, and the musical language are so intertwined and are absolutely inseparable. Mozart is not a symbol to be placed in a room to look at. It has something to do with the thoughts and personality of the singer or the figure, the role that is conveyed. It carries with in it a very immediate reference to our dimension as human beings. Was Wolfgang Mozart a person who was vehemently committed to freedom, equality and fraternity? If we listen to the sounds of his music, the answer can only be an emphatic yes. If one reads the memoirs of his contemporaries where they recall his personality, it becomes difficult to recognize in Mozart a person always ready to offer help. We have no idea what his personal motives were for entering the Freemasons' Lodge in Vienna for charitableness on December the 14th, 1784. Political commitment is completely lacking in Mozart's biography. 
Did he have a longing for rituals in a masculine circle? Perhaps he was seeking values he could not recognize in the practice of Catholic doctrine. Or to be quite mundane, perhaps he was only concerned with making use of a network of influential citizens in Vienna. Mozart made it very difficult for posterity to recognize who he was, a life in puzzles, codes, and secret documents, the sort of thing that he was so fond of. A prime example of this is his attitude to death. After the birth of his first child, Wolfgang wrote to his father. The child is very fresh and healthy and has an incredible amount of business to do, consisting of drinking, sleeping, crying, filling his pants, and being sick. Son Raymond Theodore died two months after being born. Mozart wrote, We are both very upset about the death of the poor, fat, sweet little boy. Four of Mozart's six children died. The relationship to dying and to death was part of everyday life, with no possibilities of putting it out of mind. Would we not like to read about a Mozart who, at the death of his mother and of his four own children, and finally of his father in 1787, was completely broken up by grief. This is absolutely out of the question. Mozart apparently regarded death as fate and accepted it with corresponding composure. Mozart was still popular in Vienna and yet he was preoccupied with specific plans to move permanently to London. Nothing came of this. Instead, the Mozarts frequently moved in Vienna. They moved from the sophisticated center of the city to the much cheaper and simpler accommodation in the Viennese suburbs. When they could afford to, they moved back into town again. Mozart was not impoverished, but time and again he had no money and was in debt. Moreover, Joseph II's reform activities swallowed up huge sums of money and brought state finance to the brink of bankruptcy. Severe cuts were made in the amount of money available to artistic activities in Vienna. Mozart was only one of the many artists hit by these restrictions. But what is astonishing is the music he wrote in these times. Thank you. 